So um, the Sunrise program uh, includes uh, a, a wide population of patients across the spectrum of disease. Um, the Sunrise name, the RIS in the name, stands for Releasing Intravesical System. So any Sunrise study you hear about has a Taurus or uh, Taurus releasing system involved in it, whether as one of the arms or one of the comparator arms. Um, what we try to do at J&J &J is really um, take on the disease full stop. So our vision is to provide a solution across the spectrum of disease for every patient suffering from bladder cancer. Um, I think as we look at the portfolio and, and what we're seeing mature with the data that's been reading out at ESMO and will be coming uh, uh, next year, um, we really are identifying ways that we can bladder preserve patients who otherwise would uh, lose their bladder through radical cystectomy, perhaps offer alternatives to decades old uh, standards of care that you know, work and work pretty well, but, but obviously can um, enjoy a bit of improvement. And I'll, I'll be honest, um, you know, when I first joined J&J &J through the acquisition of Taurus in, in late 2019, um, the prior leader of the oncology TA, Peter Leibowitz, said, you know, we're really looking to inject a little 21st century uh, into the care of patients with bladder cancer. And I think that's what we're really seeking to do. Um, we know that one size doesn't fit all. And so I think, you know, with our, our recent data on Sunrise 2 for muscle invasive disease, it was unfortunate to see that not read positively, but we've learned a tremendous amount from the disease. There's some really, really exciting science emerging uh, from that trial that we're seeking to capitalize upon and, and move forward with other opportunities to, to offer those patients a, a really, really durable response as well. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I actually gave a lecture uh, a couple of weeks ago um, in the Massachusetts Innovation Day. It was a really nice event just outside MIT um, where the, the, the member of the few members of the Governor's Council actually came to listen and we were talking about the innovation across J&J. &J. And so we, we led the talk with um, TAR 200. Um, and so one might say, well, boy, that's like a really old drug, gemcitabine, you know, it's been around for 40 years and it's actually used intravenously. And, and you know, where's the novelty there? This is innovation day. Why are we talking about gemcitabine? So what's really um, curious about some of these drugs that we've tended to rediscover, if I'm honest, um, what we've learned is that the ways that certain drugs play well with the bladder um, particularly play well with the bladder without causing systemic side effects or toxicity is to use them in completely novel ways. So um, to your question, really nice work has been done historically on intravesical gemcitabine as it is placed into the bladder as a solution. So taking you know, some gemcitabine off the shelf, mix it with some saline, squirt it in the bladder. Uh, dwell times are poor, compliance is poor, don't really get great uniformity of coverage, whole, whole host of issues, but those are technical. If you look at efficacy, you know, you see complete response rates from gemcitabine alone and certain forms of bladder cancer of about 40%. And here with TAR200, we recently demonstrated at ESMO about 80%. And so you kind of stop and think and say, man, like that's not just because you put a little bit of a different drug in a device footprint and put it in the bladder. We've actually identified completely different ways in which gemcitabine is working in the urothelium. And we're really starting to re appreciate that we kind of hijacked some novel science. And that's really been the buttress for why we believe in really low consistent doses of the drug over long, long periods of time, um, being able to durably put these patients into remission um, and preserve their bladders. So kind of an aha moment was, boy, when you locally release, you can really, really change the kinetics and the way these drugs behave. And I think that's been the, the kind of moment in time for us lately. That's a really good question. So urology patients undergo a lot of procedures. So if you just think about the phenotype of the patient, we're really, really good at managing diseases endoscopically. So either cystoscopically with a camera in the bladder, we can resect tumors, we can laser ablate tumors, we can put drugs in the bladder, we can laparoscopically remove bladders. These patients, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a lot of opportunity for them, but a lot of it is mediated through scopes and cameras and, and surgical technologies. So they almost become very familiar with processes that are putting things in the bladder, taking them out. To that end, you never want to minimize that experience. So we know that placing a product in the bladder is not everyone's favorite thing, but if we can make it congruent with the practice cadence of the urologist office and the mid-level providers who can use the product, it's very fluid for them. So living within the constraints or the context of a urologic practice has really helped us. It takes about maybe 90 seconds to place the device, maybe 60 seconds to remove it. 
at all lives within the same kind of practice flows for patients in the urologist's office. To that end, the very same products they may use today to minimize side effect burden from a cystoscopy or a catheterization are the very same approaches that we use for managing side effects or or any tolerability issues we might see with TAR 200 so, or TAR 210 or intravesical TAR system. So very familiar with anticholinergic drugs, which are widely available and, and, and very well um, very well managed manage a lot of these side effects well. Um, Fluid hydration, you know, making sure patients know they can drink as much as they like. It doesn't affect the way the product works. And the fact also that they can be freely mobile because the product is not an implant. It moves around in the bladder. It, it, it kind of semi-submerges itself. So there's nothing they can't not do, but they want to make sure if it's a hot day, they stay hydrated. If they have any symptoms, they can take an anticholinergic pill. So it's, it's really one-off simple things, but very consistent with urologists are comfortable talking about already. It's a great question. So I think um, if we think back a little bit on what we discussed a little bit earlier on that kind of unlocking the science, you know, it really is interesting to see when you use gemcitabine at really micromolar doses, you start to engender some very new biology and some very new uh, pharmacokinetics, basically. So um, gemcitabine historically is a cytotoxic agent, so good at killing tumors, um, but it's a prodrug. So it has to actually get into the cell and be phosphorylated for it to actually have its anti-tumor effects. What we know to be true is that that transporter that is bringing the gemcitabine into the cell is easily saturable. So if you give a big bolus of the drug early, you really waste most of it, probably 85, 90% of it. So when you give it slower over a longer course of time, almost like loading a conveyor belt, you might see those old cartoons with Popeye, like the conveyor belt gets faster and faster and you can't load anymore. We're just constantly loading the drug and allowing it to really hijack that pharmacokinetic um, transport. Once it's in the cell, that's when we see that it has these very, very unique mechanisms, which is it can intercalate itself into the DNA strand that's being grown in the cancer cell and, and stop its uh, growth. It actually can impair the, the tumor cell's ability to repair that process. So you almost see this multimodal mechanism. And that is really only tenable when you're doing this very natural, slow release of a non-function prodrug. Now, add to that what we've learned recently, gemcitabine is really, really immunogenic, meaning that it does a lot in the immune periphery of the tumor. It depletes T-regulator cells, which are the cells that are trying to keep the immune system from getting overactive. It tends to really upregulate T-effector cells, which are the cells that kind of say, hey, that looks foreign. I should go kill that, right? If you think about rheumatoid arthritis, it's the opposite. The T regulators are completely quiet and the T effectors are out of control and they damage a joint. In cancer, you see a silencing of those T effectors and an overactivity of those T regulators. GEM is reversing that. So you have the cytotoxic benefits of locally low dosed GEM. You have the immunologic or immunomodulatory effects. We think those are synergizing, frankly, and we know they are to lead us to these really outsized responses and their durability, right? You're seeing, sure, you can get someone into a complete response and you maintain it. And that may be that immune memory that we see.